Well, welcome to the library, which is also known as the largest stack of myths in the western part of the state here. Um, I'm Rob. I uh, work here at the archives. And um, today I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of this library, which has had so many myths attached to it over the years that it's pretty hard to, to get around. And so I'm, I'm going to first talk about some of the myths and then talk about the myths after that. Uh, but let's, let's deal with the, uh, the real myths, the true myths, the most mythical of all the myths. Um, one is that, that we hear over and over and over again, is the library was designed as an office building. And it was a mistake. They, to save money, they got an architect to provide plans, and he had plans for an office building that he foisted on the university, and they turned it into a library by hook or crook, and it's never worked properly. No, not true. Uh, I'll, I'll get into uh, how this was designed, and there are lots and lots of buildings by this guy that are, in fact, office buildings. But this was designed as a library, and in fact, it's a very highly theorized library. The guy put a lot of effort into thinking about it as a library, all of which was really wrong, very badly thought, but it was very much built as a library, not as an office building. The second one is that when building the library, we forgot to take into account the weight of the books. And as a result, the library is sinking. And there's lots of different variations on this theme. One of my favorite things, because every year we hear freshmen saying exactly the same thing. The architects didn't account for the weight of the books. Oh my gosh, we're sinking. Uh, one of the variations is they uh, accounted for the weight of the books at the time, but we've added more books and now we're sinking. Uh, another is that we have, uh, this is one of the most elaborate ones, that there's a system of cables in the basement that are designed to stabilize the building in wind. And somehow those cables didn't take into account, and so now the cables are pulling us down into the earth. There's also the myth about the pond uh, being so wet that the ground, that they did account for the weight of the books, but they forgot to account for the pond, and as a result, we're sinking. <laughs> We are not, as far as I know, sinking except in our own minds. Uh, the library was built as a library. They did, in fact, account for the weight of the books. They estimated two, to two and a half to three million volumes. And oddly enough, we have around two and a half to three million volumes, a little bit more in the library now. So that is also false. Uh, I, I thought this was an oddity that was unique to UMass, but I started, I've talked to peers at other institutions around the country. And over and over, this library myth crops up, that the library didn't account for the weight of the books, and therefore it's falling. It's all over the place. It has gotten so common that there's actually a page on Snopes, the, uh, the false story website that, that tries to debunk things on the weight of the books wasn't accounted for. So it's so common all around the country that it's gotten up to the Snopes level. So there you go. We're not sinking. The pond, oh, the pond, you know, here we are, we're falling into the pond, we're sliding into the pond, uh, the pond has infiltrated the basement, all of these stories we hear almost every year, can you go swimming in the basement? No, we can't swim in the basement as far as I know, last I checked, although we did have a sewage leak a couple of years ago, which could have given us some possibility of doing that, but no, none of these are true. There are a couple of other things. Uh, I got ahead of myself, sorry, I didn't mean to click that one, but we'll stay here anyway. There are a couple of other stories that are not so untrue. Uh, one of the first ones I heard when I came here was from the son of one of our donors who said, I heard that someone jumped off of the roof of the library. And that is actually true. Uh, There's a young student named David Harges, he was a Harpen, pardon me, who was a junior in 1975, spring of 1975, who was apparently having a bit of a hard time uh, from stress or being away from home, whatever it was. And the poor kid had a group of friends who used to like to break into the top floor of the library. Now, there's a story that you used to be able to walk around the top floor and, and go out onto the balcony and look down over the edge. Uh, that wasn't certainly true in 1975. He broke, they would break into the top floor of the library. They would take the elevator up to this floor, walk up a couple of other floors, jimmy the lock, and then spend time up on the roof of the library drinking and smoking uh, marijuana. That was what they liked to do up there. And they had been doing this for a number of months when around May 14th, almost exactly this time of year, 
Harpin uh, and his friends, or sorry, it was a little bit before that, Harpin and his friends were discovered up there and kicked off for the umpteenth time and told not to come back. And on May 14th, he came back alone, broke in up there, and uh, was cornered, uh, sorry, went over to the corner, looked over the edge, which was spring day, apparently, one of the big campus ride celebrations that they had, and began calling to people down on the ground saying he was going to jump. Someone down on the ground noticed him. They, they gathered around the base of the library. They called the cops. The cops came out, and a guy named Grader, Richard Grader, who was uh, one of the young uh, police lieutenants at the time, went up there and tried to talk him down a little bit. And that didn't go all that well, apparently. Uh, he was uh, said to be very agitated, extremely upset, and wasn't listening too well, was still calling to the crowd. He got him to uh, come away from the edge, and this poor student, David, said, get me an orange soda, apparently thinking that the cop would then go out and get a, leave him alone, get an orange soda. But in fact, the cop called for backup to bring the orange soda up. And when they approached to give the soda to him, Harpin turned around and dove off the edge. And there's a rumor that may or may not be true that kids in the, on the ground were yelling, jump, jump, jump. And that's been told over and over again. So that's one of the really dark stories of the library that does turn out to be true. And it turned out that this, this kid who was uh, telling me this story that turns out to be true, we had another guy in the crowd there who says, I was a prospective student at the time and witnessed it. So I've known this is true and the uh, friends, the, the cops did everything they could to, to prevent it. And unfortunately, this is one of those terrible circumstances where students get in a very bad frame of mind and it actually happens. I yep. was in circulation desk that night. You were. Yeah. And if you want to talk about it a little more, I know a little bit about what it was like to be there. Yeah, it, it, seems, it seems to have been very traumatic for everybody. And I expect the students down below who were yelling jump were thinking it was a lighthearted thing where somebody was just calling attention to himself. I don't think they really meant to say jump, 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 but it's an important thing to remember. I know there was talk about uh, creating a memorial for him around, and I don't think that was ever done. Uh, certainly, we don't. We don't have any evidence of it having been done that I'm, I'm aware of, but it, it had an impact on, on campus for, for that period of time. So let me step back and talk about the longer history of the library because this is, this is uh, where, where I really want to go. And uh, when, the library, when the university was founded, first students arrived here in 1867, books were already beginning to come here. We were a state institution. The state appropriated some funds and people who had supported the idea of creating an agricultural college we're donating things. I noticed first students arrived in 1867. The first rare books that I can identify as coming here called rare books came in 1868 as a gift of Marshall, uh, I think it was not Marshall Wilder, but one of Marshall Wilder's friends in Boston. So we were already receiving books right away, but one thing we lacked on that early campus was a place to put the books. So they were stuffed in the instruction buildings, in, te in classrooms, and so forth, and the books were simply there to be used until Old Chapel was built which was what, 1874, if I, if I, uh, sorry, 1884, if I remember correctly. And Old Chapel, you may have seen or may wish to see, has just been re renovated uh, pretty sympathetically with the original. If you go up to the uh, old auditorium on the second floor, you can see what that was like. That was built as an auditorium. It really, it was built as a gathering space, not literally a chapel. It was called Old Chapel very early on, except at the very beginning when it was called New Chapel, because there had been another chapel that was called the Old Chapel when this was built. So it appropriated the function of a campus-wide meeting space on the second floor, and eventually the chapel was added to it. But the ground floor was in large part built as a library. And that library was uh, a particularly spacious place. You can see here. Uh, this is the spacious accommodations for the students uh, working in the stacks. And the stacks by this point, which is 1920s or so, maybe 19 teens, going up almost to the ceiling here. This is a, a very small, small space. If you go into the renovated space today, you'll, you'll really get a sense for how tiny Old Chapel is on the interior. When it was cut up into all sorts of small little warrens and rooms, it was a little harder to see. But now it's entirely open, and it looks even smaller than it did when there were all sorts of little tiny small rooms. 
we had uh, some well-appointed offices here. These are the librarians' offices. And there were very, very few librarians who worked here back in the day. But already, you can see that this is a, turn of the, a little after the turn of the century. This is barely a 25-year-old, 30-year-old building. And already, it's pretty filled up. And they were complaining already in 1910, 1950, 1920 that Old Chapel was built up. So they decided, let's build a new library and let's make it much more spacious. 1931, Goodell Hall comes along. And Goodell Hall, depending on, on who you were or where, where you are as an alum, you might actually have experienced Goodell Hall as a library. This was built as a library. It was specially built as a library, not as a campus meeting space with a library in it, a place to put the books, but as a library. By the 1960s, we began this slow expansion of the university after the Second World War. It actually began before. But that slow expansion began ticking up as we got the return of the veterans in, 19, in the late 1940s and into the early 1950s and upward. But under the administrations of the chancellors of the 1950s, the plan was to gradually increase this up to a campus of as many as 10,000 students. By 1960 or 1962, uh, old, uh, pardon me, old Goodell Hall was beginning to, sh to burst at the seams. We did not have huge book collections, but the building wasn't built to be a big library by any means. So we had modern reference desks built in there uh, with space behind to hold reference books and so forth, but it was really, really tight packed. This is actually my desk right now, but it, it looks the same as if I had been Goodell Hall. If you've seen my desk, it looks almost exactly like this. It's, it's, it was a very tough place to work after a while. And for those of you who know what Goodell Hall was built onto, if you go down to the lower stack floors in the old part, it feels like you're descending into increasingly deep circles of hell because the floors, the air doesn't circulate very well. You get down to the third floor and you begin to feel a little close. The second floor, it, it's, it's damp and begins to clutch your throat. The bottom floor, I, I've never actually known anyone who's come back from the bottom floor. <laughs> it's that bad. So they really knew they had to do something by the early 1960s. Again, the building is only 25 or 30 years old. They had underbuilt, and they knew it. So what happens is we go from this period in the 1950s where there were plans to think about expanding the campus, about opening up our curriculum, really shedding the last vestiges of being just an agricultural college and thinking of ourselves as a full-fledged university in a really meaningful way. And they began hiring faculty to do that. People like Jules Shemetsky, whom I just, met, I just saw again at, this morning at one of my uh, previous talks this morning. Jules uh, was brought in in 1958 to help build academic rigor in English department. He founded the Mass Review, which is this wonderful literary journal that they've been running since 19... 58 on campus here since Jules came in. We had people like Sid Kaplan who came in actually before him, who shored up political science, and the sciences came in one after another. But John Letterly arriving in 1962 is the watershed moment. And Letterly came in with the, with the plan of really blowing open the doors, of making ourselves a national university in terms of size and quality. His predecessors had, had had the ambition but not the opportunity. Letterly came in and had federal funding, state funding, and ambition all lining up all at once. He arrived in 1962, the same year that it was recognized after putting in the dorms up, up in the northwest corner there, that we were beginning to strain at the edges of the old campus plan. They recognized that we had to do something to make this campus better and more thought through as we develop into this planned future. So in 1962, they hired Sasaki Associates to come in and draw, draft a master plan. And this is from their master plan. It is completely and totally nonsensical. It's crazy. I have no idea what they were thinking putting this into a master plan. You can see a cartoon of the pond, but nothing else is real. Nothing else corresponds to anything. But the idea is to build, build, build. Build around the pond as the center of campus. Build, build, build. Think through what you want to do. 
Sasaki laid the idea, which had been developing slowly in the minds of a number of people around campus, that what we ought to do is bring in first-rate architects to build first-rate buildings. In my mind, that didn't happen. I talked about this yesterday. I don't want to repeat because it's too upsetting to me. But they brought in a lot of modernist architects to build these great concrete edifices that you see all around here. The last one to go in is Fine Arts Center, we have, uh, which went in in the mid-70s. We had uh, the Letterly Graduate Research Library, which went in more or less that time. The Campus Center, which went in right in about 1970. It all began with Southwest, which I guess would be down in this region. Uh, those dorms, which were opened in 1965. But all of these urban-style, concrete, brutalist buildings came in, Herter Hall, Tobin Hall, in this period of time that was set off by John Letterly, one of our great chancellors, but not, not the greatest, but one of our great chancellors. I'm just saying not the greatest, I will say that. This construction, when you're making plans for a much, much larger campus, and he said not just 10,000, they wanted 20,000. Ultimately, by 1970, we're saying 30,000 students. If you're gonna do that, students need to have books so 1962, conjoint with the Sasaki plan, is a plan to think about the library. And they did a very serious analysis of the state of Goodell Hall and recognized that already Goodell Hall, at that point, barely 30 years old, was so outmoded that it needed to be done away with. They suggested that when you look at Goodell Hall, one of the problems we're going to have is that we don't have the right staff. UMass was dramatically underfunded in books and libraries. We had a remarkable professional to paraprofessional ratio in the library of one to four. Uh, that may not have any meaning to you, but one professional for every four paraprofessionals in the library compares to most of our peers in the library world of a one to one ratio. So we had a small staff and very, very few professional librarians in that staff. That was a problem. Our staff was also tiny relative to other places. We had 28 employees at the time. Most of our peers were in the range of 36, peer, uh, 36 per. And at many of our larger peers, the people we aspired to be, they were, having, they were uh, carrying staffs of nearly 100. So we have a third to a quarter of what they had. And if you're going to add staff, you're going to have to add space. What about books? Well, in terms of our books, our acquisitions budget had increased over from the 10 years 1952-1962 by about 650 some percent, a little bit over 650 percent. And that sounds like an awful lot, but you recognize that our staff at that time had only risen a little over 100 percent. So the books are rising a lot faster than the staff, placing more pressure on the staff who were already small, and we just didn't have that many books to begin with. We had around, 1962, around 225,000 books in the entire library, which is a tiny, tiny library, even for the time. The American Library Association in 1962 recommended that a library for a university of this size and this orientation should be closer to 425,000 than 225,000. So Letterly got behind this, decided what we need to do, really, is to build a first-class library if we're going to have a first-class university. And in keeping with Sasaki's idea of bringing in first-class architects, he contacted this man, Edward Durrell Stone. He was larger than life. Um, Edward Durrell Stone was a renowned architect who would worked, uh, his most famous building was the Metropolitan Museum of Art in uh, New York, uh, the 39th, whatever it is, the uh, 1939 building, uh, international style. He had been a modernist architect. These are not models, by the way, of our library. I'll get back to that in a minute. These are other buildings by Stone. But Stone was this noted modernist architect who kept very much in the tradition of the other modernists they brought in, people like Marcel Breuer, to design buildings around here. At one point, they had Aero Saarinen uh, lined up to do a building on campus that never actually happened. But we were looking for these big name architects to bring in, and Edward Durrell Stone was certainly one of these. He was at the end of his career at this point. He'd made his, his dime 30, 35 years previously. He was still very much an, uh, a uh, lively architect, an active architect, 
by the mid-60s, later 60s. But he was beginning to reach the end of his career. And his style had changed from that early super modernist style to something that was a little bit more eclectic, incorporating more of these traditional elements into his design. And as a result, a lot of his peers in the architectural world, the architect critics, did not like Durrell Stone anymore. They thought his earlier work was good, but once he became popular, no more. So Stone was brought in and immediately identified as the man who could build a great building, a great library. He had done libraries before. Louisiana State University had built a library with Stone, and, and that was supposed to be a very successful library at the time. So one of the first things he did when he arrived here was say, where are we going to place this new library? What are we going to do with this library? Let's think about the library for a minute. They had the experience of Goodell Library being too small. We had this, this, this moment where we're thinking about expanding the university as a whole. And one of the questions when you expand the university is, who are you expanding for? Well, up until 1962, there was a heavy emphasis, not exclusive emphasis, but a heavy emphasis on the undergraduate experience. But uh, Letterly and some of his predecessors as, as well wanted to expand the graduate program as well. So the thought was brooded about in, the, in this period, 1962-1967. Let's build a graduate library and keep Goodell as an undergraduate library. Where are we going to place this new Edward Durrell Stone graduate library? Well, they looked around at a variety of places. They looked, first of all, down what, what were then the tennis courts. You may still, I still think of them as the tennis courts. It's now the undergraduate Commonwealth Honor College. And they decided that was too far away. That was out of the flow. That was out of the way. Down by the milking sheds uh, is the way it was put. Uh, so that was rejected. They thought, how about putting it right here? And that was thought as a terrible option because we were so close to the student union, they felt that if it was a graduate library, we'd get too much of the undergrad riffraff coming into this place. We don't want that. Undergrads, no, 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 no. Thank you. Thirdly, they thought of building it in the, what's now the parking lot between Goodell Hall and South College. And that was thought to be a brilliant idea because it was right near the old library where you could get uh, an efficiency of scale, combination of people working in the two. We could keep the undergrads on one side, the grads on the other side, put up a big wall in between. And besides, when it was said, it, the idea was, it says, this is a quote, to extend into a giant quadrangle to South College, which should be torn down. Uh, so I love the attitude towards the old buildings. One of the few original buildings standing, let's just tear it down because it's inconveniently placed. Ultimately, they decided that they had to debate this at a public level. Oswald Tippo, who was the provost at the time, uh, complained about this issue of siding. Why can't we just do what we want to do? He said, we have a very practical problem uh, since, uh, we, since the campus is in such an advanced state of democracy on this campus, uh, we have such an advanced state of democracy on this campus, as to where any facility is supposed to be located. We have to listen to those doggone students and those doggone alumni, no offense. So it was decided that this spot would be better. Putting it by Goodell was, was really favored by quite a number of people, uh, even in the library, but this spot in the dead center of campus with a, a, a proximity to the first library and to the second library a view over the pond, not too far from student resources, was thought to be ideal. So Durrell Stone built his vision based on where we decided. And this is his prospectus for, for the library. This is his initial sketch. And you can see here, we already had this sunken courtyard here, this deep courtyard built in. Here's the, uh, the library the way he envisioned it, South College and Old Chapel. Student Union, you can see off here. This bank of uh, windows looking over the pond was built. This was not, as far as I know. And in some of the early plans, the idea was actually to expand underground out if opportunity arose and if the need was demonstrated. But this is his vision for what the library would be. And I'll get back to part of that constructive vision in a second. But one of the questions that came up very early on in this period, 1966, 1967, when they're really getting down to the nitty gritty of designing this building is what should go on the outside of this building? And it mattered a lot because we have these modernist concrete monstrosities going in. 
uh, the campus center, the ziggurat of despair, as I like to call it, was one of those big buildings that is a large concrete presence that was already hanging off there. Herder Hall, Tobin Hall, were there being planned and built as these large concrete pours. And so Stone is faced with this dilemma. What do I, what do I put on the outside of my building and how is it going to relate to the other buildings around it? Our original buildings are all brick the traditional brick buildings that go back to the 1880s in the case of South, the New South College and to later generations for some of these other buildings all the way up into the 1940s, 1950s. But with the new wave of buildings in the 1960s, it's all concrete. So do you go with the cold gray concrete or do you do with the old warm brick? So Stone says, let's think about the two alternatives. The alternatives are, let's clad it limestone. And this drawing is actually of a limestone clad building. So we can make it look really good. We can get limestone that's shot cut limestone, where you have a textured surface on the limestone. And he says, that'll, that'll last well. It'll look nice. It'll read well with the concrete. The alternative, he said, was building with brick. Brick would articulate with the buildings like South College next to it and look more like in conversation with the older buildings around the campus. And they had this debate fairly openly. It all comes down, of course, being UMass, to money. So what was the difference? Well, they said the difference is brick takes a lot more maintenance, costs a lot more on a year-to-year -year basis once it's in place. But limestone costs a lot more at the beginning. Limestone costs around $800 in dollars at that time, $1967, around $800,000 to $950,000 more up front to cut the limestone, put the limestone in place than the brick. And that was thought to be a huge amount of money, but then people said, what about the cost of maintenance? Limestone maintenance is very, very low compared to brick. So they ran the figures and they turned out, yes, brick is much more uh, repointing the brick and going up there and cleaning and doing all the things that you have to do with brick. Costs a great deal more, but it would be uh, roughly 300 years before the cost savings of going on limestone would have effect. And their experience with having libraries turn over every 30 years or so uh, suggested that going with brick was the economical choice of the day. So they went with brick. In 1967, pardon me, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where I am in my notes, sorry. Uh, groundbreaking in 1969, uh, the uh, building was put up and uh, authorized in 67. Groundbreaking in 1969, they went through a period of uh, designing the building at that, uh, before the groundbreaking, sorry. And this is part of what they did. This is a very theoretical building. But each floor is designed around a core of elevators. They were originally planning for six elevators. You can see three and six elevators here, restrooms off. But the idea was that it was a, the, the, the floor, the donut around this center core would be where the activity took place. Now this is where Stone stepped in and really became a theoretician of the library. He said, we're going to build these floors in groups of three. We're going to have a bottom floor, which is a stack floor. The stack floor is going to be an open construction so that you can move the book stacks in, move them out. You can reconfigure them. If you needed to take the book stacks out, you could do that. But there they are. You could have above that a second floor of book stacks, which are structural book stacks. The book stacks themselves contribute to carrying the weight of the floor above and distributing it out. So these floors are, are fixed. They are what they are. You have Room for study around the edges, around the outside of the libraries, but the stacks cannot be moved. They are intrinsic to the floor itself. On top of that, you have what they called, what he called a study floor. And if you read his idea here about what this study floor meant, Stone is thinking about the modern university in 1967, 1969, 1970. And he says, what do we need? We need a place for departments to come and be surrounded by their materials. So these study floors are built with seminar rooms out on the, on the corners, big classrooms centered in the middle, and offices all around. And the idea was actually that a department could come and claim a floor. You might have the historians on floor 
14 or, or whatever the heck floor that would be, uh, 15 I guess it would be, which is a stack floor, uh, I'm sorry, a study floor. And you would have historians' offices at the corner, places where the classes might meet there. And they, the historians, he thought, could simply take the elevator up to their floor, get out, interact with other historians. And when they needed a book, they could walk down a set of stairs to get books here, walk up a set to get the books above them, and you would have the Library of Congress D above and E below and F below, and they could get everything right there within hand distance. What a wonderful idea. But he didn't realize that historians do not take stairs. So historians would go up to their floor, and they would then punch an elevator to go up or down one floor. And the students still do it today. I love it. When they're going to the rec center, they'll take an elevator up one floor to get from the lower level to the ground floor so they can walk out to the rec center. I love our students. But they were no different back in the, late, in the 60s and 70s. Stone simply didn't realize it. What he was doing was placing much more stress on the elevator system than ever was recognized. They curtailed because uh, in inimitable UMass fashion, there was poor conversation, let's say, between the physical plant on campus and the building commission out in Boston, between the administration here and the people doing the work and the contractors and the legislature and the trustees, all on their, each on their own page. So everything is delayed. The concrete cladding, when they finally made the decision on what, pardon me, the uh, limestone cladding, they decided to make that decision only when it became obvious that if they didn't make a decision, it was going to push them further down the road. And every time they got pushed further down the road, they had to cut another floor off of the library, which meant less room for books, less room for, for people. So all of this is pushing pressure on the design and on the builders. And uh, Stone decides finally which cladding to go with, which plan to go with, but they have to cut corners in things like a sixth elevator that have a real impact on the long term of the library. So they build the library. This is uh, one of uh, Stone's other buildings. If you imagine this in red, it would look like our building. This is almost exactly our building where they dusted off the plans of the UMass Library and made an office tower out of it in Chicago. This is the Amico building. And so the myth about office tower is, is partially true, but it wasn't that they took an office tower and made it into a library. They took a library and made it into an office tower. It works a little bit better that way. But you can see the, the similarity there in his design. But the construction starts in uh, 69, goes and is completed and delivered in 1970, January 1973, I'm oh, sorry, uh, January 1973, taken possession by the university who authorized the work going on here and say everything is hunky-dory. And in June, they have a celebration. They move in. All the books from Old Goodell get carted over to the library at considerable expense, great deal of expense to move those books in order from the library. You can't just move them over randomly. They have to go into a special location. You have to have specialized movers to do this work, even though it's all of 100 yards at most, if you imagine it. And they have a dedication in uh, the middle of the uh, summer of 1974, uh, pardon me, the fall of 1974, where you can see Randolph Bromery having a, a very good time uh, and quite a nap, Oz Tippo here and, and a speaker. Uh, I had to put this picture in uh, because it's, it's Bromery falling asleep at a dedication ceremony, which I certainly would have done. The library is immediately taken over by students. And you can see, this is a, a shot very, in these very early days, right after it opened, of what it looked like. Uh, a wide open expanse. You see a couple of card catalogs, periodicals, uh, desks for students to study. This is the main floor downstairs, the lower level. It's a wide open space, bright sun up in these eggshells that you see above you, which, which everyone hates now, but which were looked at as being really uh, unpleasant then. But the library had this beautiful view onto this courtyard, which was always very popular. And students really needed a non-social place to study, a place where you could come study together in an academic way that you couldn't do in the student union. The student union had already outgrown itself with the vast growth of the campus. And this pulled as a magnet 
students from all over here uh, into the library here to work with our collections and to work with one another in this space. It, it was a success. You can see here uh, Mel McIntosh, who is still on the library staff here after all these years. This is her back in 1974, I think it is, uh, helping someone or, or convincing someone that she's helping him. I'm not sure which. But this is what the library was like, a big success in the early 70s. There was a little bell that went off in September 1973, within two months of opening, that probably should have been paid attention to. Uh, somebody came down one day and said that there was a brick falling off, a piece of brick on the ground. Not this actual brick. I made this up. This is Photoshop. <laughs> but that's okay, too. Uh, this little brick was discovered outside there, and somebody said, what is this? Where did this brick come from? And they said, well, we ought to look into it, right? We have 28 stories of brick sitting here, and we probably ought to know where this random piece of brick came from. So they called in Stone, uh, the architect himself, and brought in an engineering firm uh, called McGuire to come with him to do a field examination. Look around, check the, the cladding, see what was going on for what they call possible defects in the brick and the, or the construction work. And they pretty quickly determined that there were, in fact, problems, but they were not structural problems. They were the brick, they were located in the brick and how the brick was attached to the building. So right at the very beginning, they're recognizing this initial the issue there. And in that first inspection, they decided the problem was that the specifications for the building required weep holes, little holes every here and there in the brick face to allow any water that had infiltrated behind the brick to move out. If you don't do that, the water sits behind there. We live in Massachusetts. I grew up in California. We didn't have to worry about this stuff. But in Massachusetts, we freeze. Every June, it seems, we freeze. But certainly in the winter, we freeze. And when that water behind the bricks freezes, it expands, it cracks things all around it, and pushes that brick outward. And the fear was that this would cause pieces of brick to fall. For a while, they thought maybe it was the whole thing would fall, but this lack of weep holes was determined to be a problem. Now, the Bureau of Building Construction came in, and they were aware of the problem within about a month because there was such poor communication. They were not called in immediately. But they came in. They held a, a meeting out in Boston to discuss the problems with the building in Amherst. And in real characteristic Massachusetts fashion, they did not invite people from UMass to come out to their meeting out there. They contracted with Daniel O'Connell's sons, a, a firm in Holyoke who had been involved in overseeing construction of this building, and they called in O'Connell's to do a separate look at this and determine, is it really the weep holes? Is there something more serious? What is it? And O'Connell's sons came out, and I, I don't want to make them the bad guys in this because I'll say this up front, I don't think they were the bad guys. They were involved in this and it was a traumatic experience for O'Connell's sons because they were called all sorts of things over the next several years. And uh, I've done uh, an interview with one of the former muckety-mucks in, in O'Connell's. I guess you call him executive, but I'm not sure that's the right term in O'Connell's. And to, to this day, he's very defensive about their role in all this and about what they did and insists that they didn't do anything wrong. And I think he's convincing enough to me to, to say that I don't think he believes they did anything wrong and maybe they did not. But it's very clear that they were called in in this October 1973 episode. And they looked around and they said there was a problem in that some of the, brooks, the bricks, they said, oops, uh, this is actually a picture of the library a little bit later. Uh, but, but he said some of the bricks were sawn a little bit too thin. That's the way, that was the words they used, which caused them to break away. And what they were referring to was that the bricks are attached to the surface. Uh, sorry, let me go on this side. The bricks are attached to the surface of the building using these L brackets here. It's important to recognize this, and I'll go through this a little bit. They have L brackets are supposed to be placed roughly every 30 feet up the face of the building. And each L bracket carries that packet of bricks. So they're carrying a lot of weight somewhere around 6,000 pounds of bricks, three tons of bricks 
per L bracket, roughly speaking. The brick is supposed to have, sorry, the, uh, the bricks out here are supposed to have weep holes every here and there, right above the uh, brackets to allow water to get out. Behind it, there's a little insulation, and there should be a little bit of material in here that you can see over there in the green that uh, allows material to flow out properly and these bricks to expand and contract. And below this bracket, you're supposed to have a little bit of semi-compressible material so that when the bricks shift in hot and cold, they can move up and down as independent units, not as an entire face of the building, but as these 30-foot segments. They're just a tiny little bit of play up and down. It's supposed to be done by having a compressible material under that bar. So O'Connell said they looked at it and they determined that the bricks, some of the bricks, they said, a few of the bricks were sawn too thin. And what that means is, this is sort of upside down the way I understand it's done, is that the bricks to hide the bracket are sawn on site to remove a piece of the brick so that it can fit up over that bracket like a hand and glove. And this front of the brick hides it. And this, some of these were sawn too thin here so that these became too fragile and simply broke off. They said the weep holes were present, but they apologized, and this is a quote, that these few bricks got past us, but we feel certain we have taken care of the problem. That was their, their little quote. We feel certain that we've taken care of the problem. So as of October 1973, the BBC, the Building Commission in, in Boston, uh, sorry, Building Construction, Bureau of Building Construction in Boston, feels that they have looked at the problem and dealt with it adequately. Two years go by. November 1975, nobody's reported anything in the interim. Until one day, somebody says, you know, I was walking in and a brick went sailing by my head. Now, they weren't hit, but you don't expect bricks to rain from the sky very often. So they thought this was something that ought to be talked about, and they reported it. And they said, you know, walking into the library the other day, a brick came sailing by my head. Let's look into it. So they did look into it. And in November 1975, they brought in campus folk who sat at the bottom with binoculars and looked up, and they identified 38 instances of defective brick out there, almost all of which, 37 of which, were associated with this period, this place right here in the design, right above that ledge where you would expect failure to happen if you're an engineer. All the pressure comes down on these bricks. If you don't have the weep holes, that's where the, the water is going to expand and contract. You have this zone where the compression is supposed to happen. All that is happening at that little face. And that seemed to be a problem point because 38, 37 of the 38 instances they could find of brick failure, what appeared to be brick issue, if not brick failure, was happening right at that spot. So December 1975, they call out O'Connell's again, and they send out three guys to repair the facade. They do a little bit of further work and try to clean it up. They claimed at that point that there were some other things that had to be thought about that, that went into this. And they said at that point that they reckon that some of the issues are probably due to the fact that when the bricks were going in, they put them in in cold weather. And the cold weather plays havoc with the concrete and the mortar and all these other things that you're using to attach. To do this, the, the reason they put bricks in in winter when they were putting it in is because they needed to save money. To save money, they accelerated the construction schedule. So what they did was pretty ingenious. They built scaffolding around the library wrap the scaffolding in plastic. And they had this, the scaffolds in there where guy, the masons were putting the brick in there, and they heated inside that little plastic dome to whatever degree it can. But in Massachusetts, in winter, sitting on a scaffold 25 floors up with a little plastic around you, it's still cold. And they said this might have caused some problems. They noticed that there were all sorts of problems with these angles too. Instead of putting a flexible, compressible material, pardon me, under here, they discovered that they had used mortar, hard, inflexible material, so that instead of dampening the weight of bricks, it became a single column of pressure all the way up and down the exterior there. That didn't seem to be particularly good. But they still said the facade is okay. 
it's going to work for us. The next year, next spring came, and they decided that in case there was going to be more spalling, they were going to put up a little four-foot high fence around the library to keep people away. That was their solution. Rather than trying to get at the structural problems that they designed, let's just keep people away from the front of the building. So in 1976, they put up this little barrier all the way around. The, the uh, BBC off in Boston holds a meeting, again, without UMass as far as I'm concerned, uh, or as far as it seems. And they decided simply to, to deal with it this way by allowing people not to notice. This continues for a little while, and it seems that we're getting away with this because no one complains about falling bricks because no one's near the building. Until July 1975, 79, pardon me, six years after the building has been open, we have an employee of the library who walks in one morning and sees four pieces of brick on her path into the library. And she decides, Maybe this is an issue I ought to report because the bricks are coming down again. So she goes to the head of the library and says, you know, there's bricks out there. The head of the library goes to the provost, who then goes to the chancellor, who then talks to the president, who eventually talks to people in the legislature and the trustees, and everything goes crazy. July 1979 is when these chips are found, and for the first time they bring an outside firm to look at these problems, and I... Uh, I don't think I have a slide here, but this will work. This is a picture from earlier this week of uh, one of those bracket areas with some of these lovely bricks that are tilting out at various angles. They look like my grandmother's teeth is the way I think of it. Uh, but these are modern bricks. But in 1979, they bring in an outside firm to take a look at what's going on, a firm called Loomis & Loomis, who, who I think you brought that report out, didn't you, Aaron? Yeah, so this is an independent engineer firm who comes in at this period of time and they look seriously at the supports, the L brackets, at the bricks, at the weep holes, at the mortar, at the flexible construction material in between, all these other kinds of things and they determine that there are certain serious innate issues going on here. They look and they said each of these L brackets are designed to carry 6,000, oh, sorry, 4,200 pounds, two tons, I said three tons earlier, two tons, but they were in fact carrying three tons. If you looked at the specification they sent out to the architects in the first place, they called for six inch by six inch L brackets, pretty big L brackets. But when it came time to draw it up on the plan, somehow those six inch brackets became five inch brackets. So somebody made a mistake and they, they, they put in with five inch brackets. And of course, O'Connell Sons had noticed this and had reported that there were issues with the brackets and the, screw, the bolts that were used to, to put the brackets onto the wall. They noticed a whole lot of other things, including the mortar and all these other things that I've already mentioned. So in September of that year, Henry Klofler, who was the chancellor at the time, decided enough was enough. We're going to shut the library down. To shut the library down is not an easy thing. They close it off, and still we have students coming in here who theoretically need books. At UMass is always a question, but they do, in theory, need books for some of their classes. So they decide we're going to shut for safety. We're going to shut this place down. And we're going to move a quarter million books back from this library to the old library, Goodell Hall. And that transfer costs a great deal of money. It was a huge amount of money to move them over. It was a huge amount of money, even larger, in fact, to move it back per book because you have all the upfront costs of doing that and all of the problems of getting things back into a library that had been a library that was no longer being used in that way. So by this point, there were about a million volumes here, a half to a third, uh, sorry, a third-ish to a half ultimately went back to Goodell, and they decided to close it down entirely for that period of time. The trustees went to the state legislature and insisted that we be given money to do this. Loomis recommended putting up hay bales because the old barriers had been removed, thinking it was perfectly safe, so they put up hay bales, which look even better than the cyclone fence, around the edge of the library. And those hay bales were designed to prevent bricks, if they fell, from going over to the pedestrians on the outside, but they also provide a little bit of uh, cushion in case things fall. If you could, they said, we've done a test by dropping bowling balls off of high things, I mean almost literally, onto hay bales, and those bowling balls hit the hay bales and it takes all the force out of the fall. It's a wonderful thing. So they put up two bales of hay bales, uh, two, uh, two uh, stacks of hay bales all the way around the library, and the cost for moving books continued to accelerate. They called 
three or four firms to see if they would move them. Under the circumstances, nobody wanted to do it except for a local moving firm, Sitterly, whom we still use on a regular basis. And they agreed to do it, but only if they were paid time and a half and double time on weekends. So this already exorbitant cost continued to raise. Uh, $125,000 is, I think, of what they ultimately charged. Uh, this did not sit well. Closing the library and waiting for all this did not sit well with the faculty, did not sit well with the students. Jules Shemetsky, whom I mentioned earlier, who was the president of the Massachusetts Society of Professors, the union at the time, said he had a deep concern for the secretive way in which the administrative decided to close the library, giving staff, faculty, and students alike no chance, uh, no notice of this fundamental change in their working conditions. They were angry at the closure. They were angry at the lack of communication with campus to the people who were using the campus and between the campus and the state. It continued to go on with this search because they found all sorts of issues with these bricks. And to make a, a very long and complex story short, if you look at the surface of the building, you'll see these triangular ridges running up the front of the building, right, the side of the building. And the issue, according to O'Connell Sons today, is that those L brackets are fine if you're cutting them out in the field to have a brick that lays over the side. As long as you don't cut them too thin, they're going to sit there fine until you get out to the corner of that triangle where you have two L brackets meeting together. Then what you really want to do is to shape a brick using a mold that can fit over both of those L brackets and really seal it off from water infiltration. And what they did to save money was they said, we're not going to mold bricks, which cost more money. We're going to cut them all on site using a saw. So we use these saw cut bricks all over the face with no molded bricks at all. So water, no matter what you did down here, water is still infiltrating in, still going behind there. All these other problems that we got about weep holes and brackets and bolts and whatever else are simply compounding this problem one after another after another. So the, the uh, library was closed for the rest of that semester and they brought in another firm from the state to say, is it really this dire? Are we, can we expect an entire sheet of bricks to fall? And the other, the other firm ultimately was paid to say, no, it's not that bad. Let's just put up a fence and let's just keep people away. So they replaced the hay bales eventually with a cyclone fence, which was there all the way up until the time I came here. And they took that cyclone fence and replaced it ultimately with the, the more attractive fence that you see around there now. But the problems that underlie this have never really been completely solved. They don't fall down. They're not as disastrous as everybody thinks. But the issue has not entirely gone away. They simply decided to turn away from it in a certain way. Now, in the end, uh, it, it, this has uh, been a problem for the library, but this turning away from the falling brick saga, which was probably blown out of proportion and yet serious at the same time, has never entirely disappeared. But the books going off to Goodell, ultimately, if you're going to try to have a functioning library, should probably come back. So over time, they decided the books had to come back, and they got librarians and students to bring them back. And in 1986-87, they decided they, they took money that were designed to keep up maintenance of this stuff and not seeing bricks falling off at, very often. They decided they could ultimately use that money for other library purposes. And they did some renovations in the library. It was proposed that at that point they could open up the sixth elevator shaft and put in a sixth elevator, which was badly needed, but you notice that money disappeared without the sixth elevator ever appearing at that point. And instead, they went and instead of really doing the cleanup, they had an all-campus par uh, party in which they brought in over a significant period of time a group of students and faculty and other volunteers, including ML Carr of the Boston Celtics, to come in and clean up the library, the interior of the library. The library having been pretty much restricted in use for several years, had become a place where dirt and filth and uh, graffiti and other things had taken over. And so they brought in painting crews of students who know nothing about painting but could throw paint on walls, cleaning crews and all this called mass transform, and it became a big thing. 
Some of the students objected to this, thinking that you know, we didn't pay to go to school to be put into manual labor, and that's a very old UMass tradition. Uh, but in fact, Mass Transform was successful in getting the library into a much better shape. The library was, in 1994, at, uh, named after W.E.B. Du Bois. And the proposal to name the library after Du Bois, who was a towering figure in civil rights and intellectual freedom, uh, intellectual liberty, a, a great thinker and a man whose papers are here, one of the centerpieces of our collections and special collections. This initial, uh, an initial foray to name the library after Du Bois was floated in, in the 70s or 80s. And I would have liked to think that they, the faculty at the time thought this was an appropriate thing to name a building falling apart after W.E.B. Du Bois, but that wasn't true. There is a story that the Fine Arts Center, which looks a little like a piano from a certain perspective, that someone in the administration floated the idea in front of uh, the head of Afro-American Studies at the time and said, let's name this great new building after Duke Ellington. And he, he responded with saying, over my dead body, because he did not like that building. And that was, was not going to have a building like that tagged for Duke Ellington. But in this case, the proposal simply was ignored until 1994 when a group of students led a very large and successful subscription campaign, got lots of students to sign on saying, let's name the, the uh, library after Du Bois. And the chancellor at the time, David Scott, agreed, took it to this faculty senate, drove it through, and we renamed this after W.B. Du Bois. The only people who objected were a handful of people who thought we should hold out naming rights for what had always been called the library tower up to that point for someone who gives us a lot of money. Surprisingly, no one was lining up to name the library up to that point. Now it's changed. But Du Bois' name is on the library. His papers came here. I can tell the story of that, but I, I think I'll, I'll uh, skip that. The library has changed a lot since then, since the 90s. One of the things we've done, this, I didn't have a picture of anything digital, so I took this picture instead, which I, I like this picture. Uh, it has nothing to do with anything. But we have really transformed in the time that I've been here. If you've been down to the lower level, you'll see what that space, which was open and airy and modern, looked like in 1973. In 2017, that space is a very heavily used space. Shortly after I arrived here, we went from our traditional calendar to a 24-hour cycle. Our library is open 24 hours a day, five days a week. I usually get up fairly early by most people's standards. I wake up around 1 in the morning. I'll come into work around 3, believe it or not. And at that time, when I walk in the back door of the library and I look around the learning commons, there are students all over the place. I can come in at 5 or 6. There are students here. And they're not all sleeping. They're working. This has become a very active hub of, of student life in the last 5 or 10 years. We've increasingly moved towards a digital future. We've embraced in the, the place downstairs very heavily the idea that we need to deliver our information in as many forms as we possibly can. The paper, yes, but also digital assets, which is the current student's preferred form. In special collections, we have this great love for the old rare books that you'll see here in the manuscripts. But we are also a very large and active digital center for the library, taking our rare materials and making them available digitally to the world. So this is a huge thing. I would like to think that as we digitize, the old books, many of them, the ones that are digitized, move off-site. So we're lightening the burden on the library. The library, which had too many books to plan and we're sinking as a result, we are now going to have to deal with the problem, what happens when the library rises because it is so much lighter than the world around it. And that is the future that we all face. So if you have any questions, I'd be uh, glad to uh, try to answer, but that's, that's it for the uh, library. Yes, that is my cat. <laughs> Goodell was my library. Well, oh, Goodell. Yeah, you know, I hear stories about Goodell. Goodell has that beautiful room uh, off the side of the Bernie Dallas room. That was a great place to study, and I know students really loved it. Uh, but the stacks below are, are frightening, just downright frightening. Above ground, it's great. Below ground, a little frightening. <laughs> about the Falcons. <laughs> Falcons are one of the great things to happen. How long has it been going, Carol? Five years? For the camera. For the camera. The, the Falcons, you, know, you may know that in Massachusetts, western Massachusetts, Falcons were almost driven to extinction in the 1950s. 
uh, in this region. They were almost gone entirely from this region. All the raptors, but especially falcons, took it hard. When DDT was banned, they made a slow recovery, and they moved into every high building that they could in Western Mass, including the library. I don't know when they first started to appear in the library, in the 80s. So they were nesting here every year, and about five years ago, we set up a nesting box for them with a camera on it called Falcon Cam, which has become clearly the most popular part of the library in the last five years. People love the falcons. There, there, are, there are whole groups of people who get together to watch falcon chicks being fed pigeon bits. And it's gruesome. It's, it's, it's really awful to see. But the falcons are really wonderful. And I, I swear we ought to rename the, the football team the falcons, and we would do well. <laughs> uh, but the falcons, the falcons have become a very, very popular thing for the library, and we're very lucky to have them up there. If you look at our windows, like these windows, you'll see little remnants of the falcons all over the windows. Um, every once in a while, you see feathers posted there from victims of falcons or little bits of, of falcon prey. This is falcon remains. Uh, because they're up there, they have to uh, vacate themselves. And uh, our windows have evidence of falcons every day. You mentioned the first class was 1867. They arrived 1867, yes. But we claim the university is 1863. Yes. What, what happened in that gap? It's fiction. No, uh, 1863 is the, moral, the date of the Morrill Land Grant. And it was the idea of creating a university in Massachusetts. Goes to 1963. We were chartered in 1863. But it took a while to get us off the ground to do construction and planning and so forth. And so campus wasn't ready to accept students until 1867. So it took about four years to get there. And even then, it really wasn't fully ready. You know, there's stories about the students getting off, and we're in the middle of fields, and there's a couple of buildings up there. There were only five faculty members. I can't remember the number of students, but it's a small number. So it was a pretty rough go for that first class. But they, you know, they, they arrived in 1867, graduated in 1871. That's what we call the pioneer class, the first graduating class here. So there was a, a little bit of time of planning and, and so forth, and we actually ran through three presidents during that period of time. Uh, with the uh, first guy is Henry Flagg French, uh, the second guy is um, Chadbourne, right? Yeah. It's Chadbourne. Yeah. Chadbourne is first, and then Fr French is second. No, 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 French is first. That's right. Yeah, and then Clark. And so it, it took a while to get our stride. And you know, building the campus and other things like that were part of that, but planning more than anything. When did you start coming to the university? When did women start coming to the university, do you know? Yes, uh, we, we do know. The, the, first, the first women graduates at the university were 1905, the class of 1905, and there were two then. There were women who came here as early as 1875 as special students, meaning they took in one woman who took a course here during the term as a non-degree student. And there were students, uh, women, who began coming here in the 1890s under Henry Hill Goodell's uh, presidency. Uh, Goodell said something to the effect, he said, if women want to apply, why not? And a couple did apply, not many, were brought in and didn't graduate for a variety of reasons. But 1905, there were two women who graduated. Our first graduate student was the next year, I think, or two years. Same year? Same year? So it, it was pretty early, and women were a very small number up until uh, the, the uh, Kenyon Butterfield became president right after Goodell left, and Butterfield put an emphasis on women to coming in. And with the First World War, with the men off at war, women really began to accumulate in larger numbers to the degree that in 1919 they built the Abbey, uh, Abigail Adams dorm, which is the first all-woman's dorm. So there's a a 15-year period where women are ramping up and it suddenly accelerates with the need to create permanent housing for the women. Uh, so by that point, women are still a, a distinct minority on campus, but they're, they're larger numbers. Well, first, you put it. Uh, do you perhaps know when the first African-American student was? I, I do indeed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, George Ruffin Bridgeforth is the first African-American student. He arrived here in 1897, graduated class in 1901. And from Bridgeforth 
up until 1912, there were nine African-American students on campus here who came usually one a year, two in one year, and you had a couple of gap years in there. But there seems to have been an effort on the part of the university, I shouldn't say effort, a willingness on the part of the university to accept African-American students. And to, to give a long story short, all but one of those nine students came with a degree in hand already from a historically black university in the South. All but one of those nine came from the South up here to get a second degree. All nine spent some time teaching in historically black colleges and universities after they graduated from here. The one became a dentist. He went into professions. But they were a very distinguished group. We had two or three college presidents, and I'm forgetting which right now, who came out of that group of nine. And the others were distinguished professors in one thing or another, usually agricultural field. But it is a remarkable record. Uh, that group in the class of 1905 included a man uh, who uh, became the first African-American captain of a football team at a predominantly white university, as far as I know. Uh, he played for the first African-American head coach at a predominantly white university, a man named Matthew Bullock. So we had some very early outreach at a very low level. What, seemed, what happened, though, is that after around 1912, 1913, the numbers of applicants declined, probably because the opportunities in the South improved slightly for African American students, or at least opportunities at other universities improved. And UMass doesn't seem to put effort into trying to recruit. And so the numbers tail, uh, tail off until the 1960s, and really until the foundation of the uh, Collegiate Center for the Education of Black Students, SEBS, in 1968. Uh, which was founded by Randolph Bromery, uh, Bill Darity, and a couple of other people. And that group was tasked with going out and recruiting and retaining African American students. So that was the beginning of a transformation. But there's a, an early history there that's a very, very interesting history uh, that uh, unfortunately isn't followed up as much as I would like to have hoped in retrospect it would have. Is there a sense of who the top couple, three uh, distinguished graduates of the university are? Presidents, governors, yeah. heads of business? It's, it's hard. You know, there are, there are a fair number of, of pretty, uh, pretty distinguished alums out there. And it depends on where you want to look and, and what you want to define as uh, for the property. But, you know, we have a number of CEOs and innovators. We have people like Kenneth Feinberg, who I'm pointing to our former Kenneth Feinberg archivist here, special you know, class of 1967, special master of 9-11 Victims' Compensation Fund. And Ken Feinberg, for anybody who, who's met him or knows him, is a fantastic individual, a wonderful human being. And I look at Ken and I think there's, there, you can't have too many people who are more distinguished than Ken Feinberg, but there's an awful lot of people when you go down who've played a role in state government, federal government, uh, people who have gone on to be CEOs of various companies. There's people like Sid Topol, class of 1947, who went off, uh, became um, uh, an engineer with Raytheon and became uh, CEO and president of Scientific Atlanta. And uh, has, has subsequent, since, to, since subsequent to his retirement, he says he's come out of the closet as a philanthropist. And if Ken Feinberg isn't one of the great people I've met at my time in UMass, Sid Topol is. But there are many, many others who have done very well, and we don't do as good a job, I think, at UMass of, of, of letting that be known that we have these alums who are really fantastic people who have done wonderful things and who, at, at least in many cases, I think Ken would say and I think Sid would say if I could speak for them and I really, really can't and should not. But I think they would say that they, what they learned at UMass was valuable to them and set them on the path to what they have become. So I'm... We, we have not had a governor yet, uh, as far as I know, and that's a shame. Uh, are you available? I mean, <laughs> we... we we, we have really, in politics, we've had a lot of state reps. You know, uh, Stan Rosenberg is the, the state president of the state senate. Another very, very good guy. John Oliver, who's on faculty here, was our former rep here. Not a grad, but you know, certainly a, a veteran of UMass. So we've had an impact there, but uh, not at the governor's level, uh, as far as I know. And, and as far as I know, also no state senator, uh, no national senators, uh, to my knowledge. I could be wrong. Anything else? 
If, if not, I welcome you back to UMass and glad to have you here and uh, hope your, your trip is an enjoyable one.